This morning we have the infamous Mr. Gibbs. He is coming to give us a message from God's Word, and we are always thankful to have some of our faculty come and, and share what's on their hearts, uh, share what God has for them to say. So we look forward to that. Thank you for taking the time to do that. I know you're pretty busy, so uh, thank you. Uh, so this morning, I, listen up, all eyes up here. All right, this morning, um, I don't really know what happened, but I woke up and I came to school, and I sat in my office, and it was just like this weight came over top of me. And I spent all morning pretty much in prayer before I had to come to the little kids' chapels. Um, and I didn't really know why until now. And we've been, uh, we're a couple months, maybe a month out from Spiritual Emphasis Week and everything that went down then and um, just kind of leveled out. And I believe that we're on a new level than we were before then. But I also believe that we can get kind of caught up in just that everyday routine. Okay? And I feel that happening. And I want to just spur you on to continue living and walking in the Spirit of Jesus. Okay? So I want to read real quick through the first part of Romans 8. Right? If you've never done that, I've, I've read it with some of you, I went through it with some of you um, individually, but I want to read it as a whole group. I really just want to put back an emphasis on walking in the Spirit. So just close your eyes and just listen to what Paul has to say about living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. He starts off, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin to condemn sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might not or might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning give you all the praise and all the glory for what you've done for each one of us. We thank you for a couple weeks ago and moving dramatically through this school and through each one of these young men and women. And I just pray today that you would awaken us again through prayer, through worship, through the hearing of God's word and the message that you've given Mr. Gibbs. Um, just spark a fire in us to just pursue you more 
and more and more and submit to you continually every day. Give us the strength to do that, to walk in Christ and to see this world, this fallen world, through the love and the grace and the mercy of your son, Jesus. Father, I pray a special blessing and anointing over Mr. Gibbs that you would fill him with your spirit and give him wisdom and insight even now. He's been preparing and, and thinking about what to say and what you would have him to say, but Father, I, give, I pray that you would just give him revelation even in the moment to say what needs to be said. And I pray that always you would give us all ears to listen and eyes to, to focus and the mind to just perceive things that are above and not things that are in our flesh. So as we worship you and as we hear from you, just pray that we would be attentive to your spirit in our own lives and what you're doing through this school. And I pray that overall when we leave this place that we've exalted your son, Jesus. Because if we leave here not doing that, then we have done nothing. So we give it to you today. Come, Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.
or chaplainship as he talked about Mr. Gibbs and just give him the words to speak this morning. I pray that you'll strengthen us all and just keep us moving in, uh, in your direction. Keep strengthening us and uh, keep helping us to, or through our trials and just bless this service. In your name, amen. Okay, it's been a long few weeks for me. Okay. Just passing lots of stuff going on, everything that I do. And uh, so I've been praying through this and thinking through this. I just saw a lot of different stuff on my heart and my mind that God's been kind of working with me. And it's kind of observations about what's been going on here and the world at large. And even up to this morning, I didn't quite figure out exactly where this was all going. Like, I had lots of ideas, and trying to put it all together wasn't quite coming, which is really frustrating for me, because I like knowing exactly what I'm going to say. I like rehearsing. I like being on top of stuff. Okay. Uh, but I think we got it pretty well figured out this morning. I feel like it's kind of part one of a two-part message. I'm not sure when part two will be, but we'll get there at some point in time. So uh, thank you to my classes this morning for cooperating. His eyes wrapping stuff up. There, there's your shadow, JC, okay? So, thank you, Mr. Mack, and thank you, Mr. Hammond, for letting me steal one of your Christmas blend coffees this morning. I don't think you knew that until now, but, so, thank you. So, they're awesome. Let me pray, and we'll get started today with this message. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the awesome privilege it is to be here and just to talk about your word. And God, I know that the words I say mean absolutely nothing unless your spirit is here with us. So I pray that you would be here with us through your spirit. That as we look into the Bible, as we look into scripture, that, that would speak to our hearts, to our minds. That we'd understand who you are more. God, that we'd grow to love you more. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, long-winded introduction because that's the way I do things. So, uh, I started thinking about this earlier today, and I have a love-hate relationship with sports. Okay. Uh, I've, told, I've told many of you about this before. Growing up, this, I think you all know this, I was, I was a nerd. School came easily, sports did not. Okay. Spelling test, no problem. Baseball, not so much. 0 for 17 one season with 16 strikeouts in Little League. Okay. That takes some sign of impressive lack of talent on my part. Thank you. Thank you. On the other hand, I enjoy sports, I really do. Okay. But at the same time, it frustrates me when I feel like sports is just a little overblown in our culture sometimes today. Okay. People seem just a little too obsessed with it. Okay. You can make $12 million a year being a mediocre left-hand pitcher. Okay. Those of you in baseball, you know what I'm talking about. They don't do that good as a baseball player to make like $12, $13 million a year, which is, blows my mind. Okay. And yet at the same time, the flip side of this is where I go back and forth a lot, I think God gives us sports for a reason, and part of the reason is we learn some neat things from sports. It gives us the ability to reflect on other parts of life. And so kind of where I'm tying all, all this together is the idea of motivation. And especially as a coach, it's really interesting to see what motivates people in sports. Uh, for some people, it is simply the love of the game. They want to go out there, they want to compete, they want to play, they have fun simply throwing a baseball or catching a football or running fast, whatever the case may be. Other people do it for the teammates, right? Maybe the sport itself isn't that fun, maybe the practice isn't that fun, but you get some camaraderie there and you have fun hanging out with friends. That's great. Some people do it because they like shiny objects and like winning. Okay? There are people who want to win, that's all about the ring, all about the medal for winning the race, whatever it is. 
Some of you all may be playing sports solely for the hope of winning a college scholarship. So where the motivation is, you know, it's personal. And it's kind of interesting just looking at it and seeing why people do that. And where this is going with me today, though, is it one of the things I started thinking and pondering about here in the past few weeks and months is what is our motivation in our walk with Christ? theme for chapel this year is so walk in him. And one of the couple of questions I wanted to try answering today is, so what exactly does that mean? Because I think we've talked about this much. We've really kind of gotten down to the nuts and bolts. What does it look like to walk in him, to walk with God, to walk with Christ? And so for the next three and a half hours, I'm going to lay this out for you all. <laughs> Just kidding, obviously. That's about how much time it would take for a proper introduction. So I'm just going to give you just a little taste of what I've been trying to work through in my own life. And some of it's a frustration I've seen around here. Some of it's some, I have some frustration seen in my own life. And I just feel like I don't grasp this all the time like we should. Uh, so, and I think what I've seen sometimes is in contemporary Christian culture, in the United States at large, sometimes I feel like our motivation in the Christian life is that we see God as a fix. Or a fixer. And we talk about God being the solution to our problems, whatever those problems may be. Loneliness, anger, anxiety, boredom. And I don't think that's entirely a bad thing, because on one hand, we, we do believe that God is ultimately the solution. God is ultimately the answer to our life. But I, I think too often we come across sometimes, we start, we start trying to sell Jesus as a band-aid. Okay, come to Jesus, that's going to fix everything. The problem with this is twofold, this motivation for following God for only what he does for us. This leads to two problems, I think. Number one, doesn't always make things better. Just because you start reading your Bible or praying or whatever else doesn't mean all your problems are going to instantly go away. Sometimes it might get worse. And you see this throughout the Old Testament or throughout the Bible in general. Some of the most godly men and women in Scripture have lives that are pretty horrible by most standards. And we'll look at a couple of those examples briefly today. The other problem with treating God as a means to an end in our life is if God is there to fix your problems, and that's only, what happens when those problems go away? We tend to forget God. I think we're all guilty of this at one time or another. I am. Because we live in a world that is pretty much set up to distract us from thinking about things that really matter. And I love it and I hate it. Think about the changes in society in just the past 25 years. It used to be if you were bored, you were bored. Okay? Today, if you're bored, you whip out your cell phone and you start playing games. You go home and you put on Netflix for three and a half hours. Okay? A big old thing of popcorn because you microwave that pretty easily. And I'm guilty of this myself. It's easy to, to, when things are going well, to feel like we don't need God. And as a result, it starts to make us wonder, well, you know, what does our faith really consist of? So, I, I think, where I'm going with this, slowly but surely, is that to walk with God, to walk in Christ, has to do with more than just turning to God when we need Him. It needs to be something deeper than that. And so if you have your Bibles, open with me up to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read a couple passages out of here. We're going to work through chapter 11 a little bit and chapter 12. And after 20 minutes, that would really have been the introduction of what I wanted to talk about. And we'll see how this goes. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 for you all today. It says this, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not experience death, and he was not found to be because God took him away. For prior to his transformation, he was approved, having pleased God. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So the author of Hebrews here is referencing this guy in the Old Testament named Enoch. If you go through what seems to be those really boring list of names in the Old Testament, okay, Enoch's one of the early ones. 
And it talks about this begetting from the King James, right? This person fathered, this person fathered, this person fathered, this person. And Enoch's one of the interesting characters in this list in Genesis chapter 5 because he doesn't die. That's a fairly significant thing, right? Most people die. It's kind of what happens to us as humans. And if you read Genesis chapter 5, it says Enoch walked with God and then God took him. So there's this parallel here. If you kind of tie these passages together, there's this connection between walking with God and pleasing God. Enoch walked with God. We're not sure exactly what that entailed. I don't think it was literal like it was for Adam and Eve. But the idea that Enoch was so close, so focused on God, that God kind of skipped the whole death stage for Enoch and took him straight to heaven. And then you again look in verse 6 there. It says, now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. So if walk equals pleasing God, and if pleasing God is requiring faith, the connection here is that to walk in Christ means to live a life of faith in God. And faith is one of those words that we use a lot of times, and unfortunately too often we tend to use it to mean belief. Yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in George Washington. Okay? Too often in contemporary culture, people use that to basically the same thing. But again, look at the second half of verse 6. For the one who draws near to God must, one, believe that he exists, and two, rewards those who seek him. I think if I took a poll in here, even anonymously, I think 90, 95, 98, 99% of you would say, yeah, I believe God exists. Okay? And that there's some guy up there, whatever that means, Okay, who's doing God-like things. But there's more to faith than mere belief. It says, he rewards those who seek him. As we keep reading through a couple more passages, I think there's another part here that's not really stated at the time, but not only do you have to believe that God rewards those who seek him, you live your life in such a way. And that's evidence of faith. Uh, one of the quotes from the commentaries I was looking at says, Enoch was a man of faith, a faith that involves a steadfastness and a forward-looking dimension. So part of walking with God, or a big part of walking God, with God, is keeping our eyes focused on what is ahead and not just what we see right now. Because if our faith in God is only about what we get out of it at this moment, we're going to be disappointed pretty often. And again, it's where I think sports tie in a little bit. Because okay? there are moments where sports, you know, like practicing, can be fun. Okay? You're hanging out with friends, you're getting better. But typically the point of sports is not to practice, right? You're trying to get some sort of goal, trying to achieve something further down the road. I, again, I coach swimming. I, I've gotten into swimming a lot in the past few years. And I think, you know, Olympic swimming is nuts because you're training for one event for four years. Especially if you're French in the 50 for eight. You're training four years every day, not skipping practice, to swim hopefully 21 seconds. Okay. That's a lot of practice if you're not expecting much of a payoff. And our Christian life is kind of the same way. We're, yeah, we're going to see some benefits, and we'll talk about this in a second, of following God here on earth. But that can't be all there is to it. That can't be all our faith entails, believing that we're going to get blessed right here and right now, if it's going to be perfect, because we're going to be sadly disappointed if that's the case. Look down with me a little bit further into the Hebrews chapter 11. And we've skipped over a few different people, like Abraham. We're skipping our way down to Moses. I think we've all heard about Moses before. We kind of pick up in the middle of the story here. It says, By faith Moses, I'm in verse 24, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and chose to suffer the people of God rather than to enjoy the short-lived pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of the Messiah to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since his attention was on the reward. Faith entails believing that God's reward is better than what's going on right now. First of all, faith, believes that God, uh, faith entails believing that God's reward is greater than sin. Not entirely clear from here what sin uh, authors talk about with Moses, but we see this in our daily life. Okay? 
Most sin in our lives is a refusal to put God in his proper place. It's not believing that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. Whether it's relatively simple stuff like lying or laziness or the bigger sins, turning to whatever you can fill in there okay, for comfort. If it's pride, thinking it's all about you. Most sin in our life is an attempt to fill a space where God should be. Pleasure. Talks about pleasure there. We live in a world that's very easy to be to find pleasure. Depending on how you define pleasure. Again, for me, it's pretty much sitting down on a couch watching TV. Okay. Being left alone. That's pretty pleasurable for me most of the time. God's reward is greater than home and family. Family is important. I love my family. Okay, it's one of the greatest blessings in my life, maybe the greatest blessing in my life. But you see throughout uh, the story of the Bible, people are willing to forsake their family and follow God. Reputation. We believe that God's reward is greater than reputation because following God is not always going to make you look good. Especially in a world today where people are moving further and further away from absolute truth. And they say, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Scripture, I'm a Christian, I'm following Jesus, and I believe that there's things called right and wrong and sin. It's going to make you look bad sometimes. Standing up for what's right is going to make you look bad sometimes, even in a Christian school. God's reward is greater than wealth. You see this from Moses here. He had the opportunity to be basically Pharaoh, to be second command of Egypt, and said, no, I'm going to leave all that, all the wealth that it entails, and go be with God's people instead, and lead God's people. And again, today, it's very easy for us to get distracted by stuff like money. Community. This is something I think it hits home for me here recently as well. You know, one of the things I think the biggest thing GCI is going for is the fact that we care about people. Not perfectly, and I realize there's issues at times. But you have faculty members in a school that ultimately we try to take care of each other, I think. And it's a great blessing to be here. So a lot of people point to you for being here, the GCA family. And yet, even having brothers and sisters in Christ is not a substitute for God himself. And if all we say to each other is, hey, I'm here for you, and we fail to point people to Christ in the end, we're missing the point as well. So we've talked this idea of God's reward a little bit, and I haven't really told you what God's reward is. He okay? talks about these different promises that God has, and that Moses and Enoch trusted God that he's going to reward them. So what is greater than sin, pleasure, home, family, reputation, wealth, community? What is greater than all these things? I think there's lots of different rewards that we see promised throughout Scripture, but the one biggest one is God himself. And so as we talk about what it means to walk in him, is it Talk about what it means to walk in faith. A big part of that is simply realizing that God himself is our ultimate reward. This is ultimately the message of the gospel. Right? We've been separated from God because of our own sin, and God gave us himself. Jesus sacrificed himself for us to reconcile us to God. Faith is believing in the greatness and the glory of God and acting on it. Faith is believing their ultimate reward is not pleasures here on earth. It's not kind of all of our troubles being taken away. But faith is ultimately being united with God himself. And we see this a little bit further in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And you skip over just a little bit more. It says, therefore, since we have also such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has set down at the right hand of God's throne. So we talk about God being with us, and that's true all the time, but in the Christian life, as we walk, as we run, however, what metaphor you want to use there, ultimately we do this by keeping our eyes on Christ, keeping our eyes on 
God, keeping our eyes on the goal. And again, this ties back to sports a little bit. If you watched uh, the Olympics this year, some Olympics, 200 fly swimming. There's a big thing between Michael Phelps and Chad LeClow. Chad, a South African swimmer who won the 200 fly in 2012. And you may have seen memes go around the internet where LeClow has this nasty habit of looking to the people by next to him. I have a few swimmers and runners who do the same. Um, and LeClow lost to Phelps in this, partially because he kept looking to the side rather than keeping his eyes on the prize and the goal. And what happens is when we, fail to, when we fail to keep our eyes on God, when we fail to believe that God is ultimately rewarded, it becomes very easy to get off track and start wavering from the path that God's laid out for us. And this is kind of leads me all to where I wanted to talk about more today, which is just this sense I've had in my own life and a lot of people around me and here sometimes in church and Christian culture as a whole, that we simply don't talk about the nature and the character of God enough. If we believe that God is ultimately a reward, why don't we talk about him more? Not just in a way that's being there for us, but who he is, his characteristics. We rant and we rave about all sorts of stuff in culture today, whether it's great athletes or great video gamers or great musicians or actors or actresses or whatever. And we'll talk about it, our eyes will light up and we'll get all excited. And I feel sometimes we just don't do the same when it comes to God. We're talking about the all-powerful, all-loving, eternal creator of the universe. And we kind of treat it as a home hung humdrum sort of thing. And I feel guilty of this myself way too often. And I wanted to come today and talk about the nature, character, nature and character of God, try to blow up your minds and hearts with talking about God, and I just couldn't find the words. So maybe that's part two for another time. And I'm actually close to being done, because I don't know. What I do know is that to worship God, or to know God is to worship Him. And when we believe that God is ultimately a reward, we walk in faith with our focus on Him that's going to result in us talking about the promises of God and living for the promises of God and everything else fading. And just what's been going through my head over the past couple of days are just some old songs. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church where we did lots of hymns. And you know, I didn't like them much at the time. But I'm glad I listened to them. I'm glad I sang them. Because one of my, some of my fondest memories still are sitting in an old Baptist church in pews, which most churches don't do anymore, singing songs with lyrics like these. O oh, four thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. I, don't, I know we don't talk like this quite anymore, but the words still ring true. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb, ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Great hymn of four thousand tongues. Another one, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And the great Annie Crosby. We talk about all sorts of other stuff, and we sing about other stuff, and God gives us the gifts of music, and we use it to talk about all sorts of things. In our daily life, how much time do you spend thinking something about the wonder and the awe of God? How much time do I spend that? And the answer is not enough. So I'm actually about ready to wrap up here, and Praise God wants to come up. I just want to read a couple more scripture passages to maybe get you thinking a little before we worship. All of life is worship, I believe. Everything we do is ultimately a response to what God has done for us. And yet, when we sing songs, we keep the focus on God. It's this particular kind of worship that helps us remember who God is and what he's done. So I just want to close a couple scripture passages. Again, I wanted to talk about the nature and character of God today, but I just couldn't 
come up with words any better than the Psalms say. So a couple Psalms here, passages from the book of Psalms, this hymn book of scripture. Psalm 8.1, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. Psalm 19.1 and 8, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The commandment of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Psalm 115.1, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your faithful love, your truth. Psalm 118.1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his faithful love endures forever. If you all stand with me, I'm going to pray, and I'll turn it over to the praise Lord. Father God, I thank you. Thank you for who you are. The all-powerful creator of the universe. Who loved us even when we didn't love you. God, forgive us for the way we just come so easy to ignore you and what you've done. Give us my own life many times as well. So I just pray that you can work in our hearts and our minds that we, as a student body, as a school, as a Christian community, would actually talk about what you've done for us. Not just on Bible study times or Bible class or chapel, but all the time, every day. God, as we do this, we help each other keep our focus on you. God, that we would believe that we would have faith that you are better than anything else in this world. And God, that that would be evident in the way we live our lives, in the words that we say, in the actions that we have, and the thoughts we have. God, you get the glory, because we know that ultimately all glory and all honor belongs to you. We thank you for this in your son's name.